Hello. Hello, 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 hello. How's everybody doing? Let me just tweet this out, and then we're getting this show on the road. Right. Let me post this in Discord as well. The issue is always the start of the stream. Hey, hey, uh, Magian Zero. Also, Neil Moirai tipped me before the stream. I'm in a group chat with them. Thank you if you're watching. I really, I really do appreciate it. It's tremendously helpful. Money is a little tight. And so it's going to be a slow build to like a partner level, you know? So I thought um, maybe a stream every two weeks or something dedicated basically to trying uh, to get us money for groceries. So if you're not familiar, um, I don't know how many people have been watching right now, uh, but if you're not familiar, Warren, my boyfriend, is here and he's come from Utah. I basically extracted him from that hellhole uh, and now he's here with me and we're trying to support ourselves through uh, through streaming, but as everyone knows, it's a very long and arduous process, so we'll see. So I decided I would torture myself to see if I can get some fundraising out of it, huh? Um, I've never read Foucault, ever, um, but I have the PDF here. I do own the physical copy of this too, so it's not pirating. Wink, 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 wink. Um, and we're going to just read through Archaeology of Knowledge. Um, does that mean you dislike his work if you haven't touched it? No, it's just it's so very outside of my research area that I've never really, really had to do, uh, really had to come across it. I am currently doing particle physics homework. Well, fantastic. We can study together. Um, this book isn't too long. It's 232 pages. Um... 229, technically. Um, and I thought I'd just read through this, try to understand what the hell's going on, and maybe chat can help me understand what the hell's going on. Because I don't really know what the hell's going on. I don't know anything about Foucault, other than that he believed in the historical a priori and the idea that the conditions that, um, that govern human experience are not something that are universal across all of time and uh, and geography, but are instead relative. And I know that Foucault is often charged with being a relativist, but apparently he denied that notion of his work. But there are a lot of people who study Foucault that want to retain that element of his thoughts. So we'll see. We'll see. Is Foucault going to come out a relativist? I have no fucking idea. So um, I don't know if we want to dive straight into it or I want to let, you know... Um, let uh, people trickle in. Maybe that'd be the better option. I'm not sure. Um, what do you think, chat? Whoever's there. Do you think we wait a bit? Do I do some React content? Should probably wait a few minutes. Yeah. Yeah. That that might that that's probably not a bad idea. No, just let people trickle in, right? Um. Okay. Sure. What if I do the um? I already did. I, do you guys do Wordle? I'm kind of hooked on Wordle, and I like that it's only one a day, so that it's a, uh, you know, because otherwise you get really bored of it, but when you're forced to do it only once a day, it's very much, um, I don't know, you get like a little, you get like a little taste of it every day, and then you have to wait till the next day to satiate, satiate, sa satiate, 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 satiate your hunger. What a strange word that is, satiate. I dwardle. Okay, yeah, I dwardle too. We can dwardle together. How about that? Um, I saw that Prince Andrew is um, no longer his royal highness, but he's still a prince. So, what's with all the books, Rem? I know you can't read. Shake my head. I know. Yeah, I know. I can't actually read. It's just, well... Oh my god, what is this? Being bad at world doesn't mean you're dumb. Here's why. 
Word games are meant to make you struggle. They wouldn't be fun if they were super easy or just another aspect of your work. Why do some people struggle with Wordle much more than others? Practice can't be that much of a factor since Wordle only came out in October, but a few cognitive functions can make a big difference, like spatial reasoning and what psychologists call fluency. There may be some correlation between success at Wordle and overall intelligence, experts say, but failing at it doesn't automatically mean you're a dummy, moron, dolt, or idiot either. Hmm. I think anyone who can't do Wordle is a dumb idiot. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Oh my god, they literally have... The photo that they have on here for the article is the word idiot at the bottom. That's like... Oh, God, it's very harsh, isn't it? Okay, look, let's just... Well, I don't know. I don't know if we should just dive into it or not. I, I don't know. Um... Oh, look, Dark Viper. I wonder if Dark Viper would want us to talk to me about philosophy. Oh, but he's doing a speed run. I'm going to message him. I'm going to message Viper. Dark Viper. I messaged Dark Viper to see if he wants to talk tonight. I think that'd be really fun. Um, but I think he's currently doing, yeah, he's doing GTA speedrun. The only GTA I ever, well, I did have GTA 5, but I never played it much. Um, I played GTA 4 a bit, and then, but I never played any of this stuff. Oh no, I played that mobile game. There was a, there was a iOS Grand Theft Auto game. I think it was like called Chinatown Wars or something. I don't know. It was really bad though. It was really it was like top down, which is what the original ones were, I think. Um, but it it was really really bad. So yeah. All right, I'm just gonna dive right into this, okay? Viewers be damned. Let's just look. People are here. They want the content, and I'm gonna bring the content, okay? So we're diving in. We're diving into Foucault. This is the archaeology of knowledge, okay? And I, sh should I read line by line? I probably should, right? I hope my voice doesn't completely and utterly get destroyed, but we'll see, okay? And then as I go through, I'll give like my own accounts and I'll highlight. It'll sort of be an insight into how I do, um, into how I study and how I annotate. What makes this work a good start? I don't know. People just suggested this one, and it's a it's apparently one of the more philosophical of his works as opposed to more historical. Like the history of sexuality, I know, is also something that people suggest, but that's much more of a historical uh, analysis as opposed to archaeology of knowledge, which I think is more on the nose, a philosophical work, I believe, at least. Hey, thanks, Question of Wombat, for the, for the follow. Okay. For many years now, historians have preferred to turn their attention to long periods, as if, beneath the shifts and changes of political events, they were trying to reveal the stable, almost indestructible system of checks and balances, the irreversible processes, the constant readjustments, the underlying tendencies that gather force and are then suddenly reversed after centuries of continuity, the movements of accumulation and slow saturation, the great, silent, motionless bases that traditional history has covered with a thick layer of events. Well, that's a really, really, really long sentence. So breaking this down, prefer to change their turn their attention to long periods as opposed to previously when they didn't, I assume. Um, that makes sense to me. Okay. We are concerned more with, um, well, when was this originally written? Because I wonder if it's changed since he wrote this. Si 1969. Okay. So... Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Like material analysis and whatnot. Um, like a Hegelian approach to history very much falls under that. Hey, thanks, FZYTV, Fizzy TV, maybe. Um, the tools that enable historians to carry out this work of analysis are partly inherited and partly of their own making. Models of economic growth, quantitative analysis of market movements, accounts of demographic expansion and contraction, the study of climate and its long term changes, 
the fixing of sociological constants, the description of technological adjustments and of their spread and continuity. These tools have enabled workers in the historical field to distinguish various sedimentary strata. Linear successions, which for so long have been the object of research, have given way to discoveries in depth. From the political mobility at the surface down to the slow movements of material civilization, even more levels of analysis have been established. Each has its own peculiar discontinuities and patterns, and as one descends to the deepest levels, the rhythms become broader. Okay, I think this makes sense to me. Um, I guess historians used to look more at isolated um, events and not necessarily try to, to draw sort of broad sweeping generalizations from them, but with the dawn of of new history and new sociology um, in the late 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, these models that he's describing that people are now able to use, uh, like quantitative analysis of market movements and whatnot, um, it allows you to essentially connect all of these individual instants to look at long-term trends and establish why these trends occur causally, perhaps. And so linear successions, which for so long have been the object of research, have given way to discoveries in depth. So I assume that's like, um, I assume that essentially there are going to be multiple ongoing processes that are happening over a period of time. Um, and like, so if we had a hundred years of history with a bunch of given events, there are many different ways to understand the relationship of these events, which is not just studying their linear succession, but the relationships they hold with each other, like whether that be a sociological analysis. Isn't fundraising a bit misleading? No, because I'm short on money and we need food. <laughs> it is not at all misleading. Um, hi, Soft, how are you? Okay. From the political mobility... Oh, no, I already read this. Okay. Beneath the rapidly changing history of governments, wars, and famines, there emerge other apparently unmoving histories. The history of sea routes, the history of corn or of gold mining, the history of drought and of irrigation, the history of crop rotation, the history of balance achieved by the human species between hunger and abundance. The old questions of the traditional analysis. What link should be made between disparate events? How can a causal succession be established between them? What continuity or overall significance do they possess? Is it possible to define the totality, or must one be content with reconstituting connections, are now being replaced by questions of another type? Which strata should be isolated from others? I don't know what strata means here. Does anyone know what he's meaning by strata? What types of series should be established? And what, what do we mean by series? What criteria of periodization should be adopted for each of them? What system of relations, hierarchy, dominance, stratification, univocal determination, circular causality may be established between them? What series of series may be established? What the fuck does that mean? And in what large-scale chronological table may distinct series of events be determined? Oh, good night, Soft. Which book is this? This is the ar this is Archaeology of Knowledge. And hi, I'm Alexander Parks. So welcome to the stream. Um, okay, so I'm not I'm not entirely sure what strata means here. Um, I assume series is just going to be a collection of historical events. I mean, I'm sort of understanding what Foucault is getting at here, that sociological and economical analysis allows us to an analyze history, not just on the basis of like these very clear events that happen, like the fall of a government, a certain war, a certain succession, etc. But instead, we can analyze history um, in a variety of different ways. And I guess he's asking, well, in which ways is this legitimate? And how should we organize series? So, like, what criteria of periodization, like, the debates around what is the Dark Age? Is there a Dark Age? Is that a poor way to understand uh, history? Does it ignore, like, geographical occurrences, like the Islamic Golden Age? Okay. That's what I'm getting. I, I still don't know what strata means, though. What is this? So, I'm going to add a comment, which basically says, huh? I don't know what that means. And I'm assuming series simply means, like, literally a collection of things in order um at about the same time in the dis oh maybe the concept of strata is analogous to geological archaeological strata like the layers you go down that represent time periods um events that you arrange into a series okay yes right whoops what did i drop um i don't even know what i dropped 
but I assume it's not important. Yes, that, that makes sense to me um, because like say we take 20 years and as a historian, I want to analyze these 20 years. Presumably there's many ways in which I can analyze this. I could analyze it basically on like the governmental level, you know, what legislation was passed, were there wars between these na between this nation and others, or I could analyze it from like a materialistic economical perspective having to do with like inflation and stuff. Um, here one sec. Um, yeah, so, so that does make sense to me. Um, at about the same time, the disciplines that we call the history of ideas, the history of science, the history of philosophy, the history of thought, and the history of literature, in those disciplines which, despite their names, evade very largely the work and methods of the historian, attention has been churned, on the contrary, away from vast, vast unities like periods or centuries to the phenomena of rupture, of discontinuity. Beneath the great continuities of thought, beneath the solid homogeneous manifestations of a single mind or of a collective mentality, beneath the stubborn development of a science striving to exist and to reach completion at the very outset, beneath the persistence of a particular genre, form, discipline, or theoretical activity, one is now trying to detect the incidence of interruptions. Yes, this is very true. This is very true. So for, coming from the history of science, at least, this is very much the case where there we have the enlightenment model of science which basically holds science is inherently rational and it's just a matter of doing it for long enough and we'll eventually kind of reap the base root of it and figure out what the hell's going on is this supposed to be an easy no it's not it's not supposed to be an easy read um hey alexander parks thanks so much for the sub i really appreciate it um but then in the history of science, we had someone like Thomas Kuhn come along and essentially argue, well, we need to be paying attention to those moments of crises in science, the moment when science almost seemed to give way. And there's this moment of, of, of crisis and of panic of, well, there's just there are these all of these anomalies that our, sci our current scientific theories can't meet. So we need to have something to replace it. And so a lot of the history of science has been focusing on those paradigm shifts and analyzing, well, what does that mean for a theory of science? What does it mean for the, the status of truth within science? What does it mean for the socioeconomic factors and cultural factors that play into the scientists when they're constructing theories? This is very much true. Um, what are you reading this on? I'm reading this on Zotero, which is a bibliography thing, but they've built in a PDF reader now, which is super, super, super helpful. So that's really awesome. Uh, yeah, Alexander Parks, thanks so much for the for the sub. Um, interruptions whose status and nature vary considerably. There are the epistemological acts and thresholds described by Bacalard. They suspend the continuous accumulation of knowledge, interrupt its slow development, and force it to enter a new time, cut it off from its empirical origin and its original motivations, cleanse it of its imaginary complicities. They direct historical analysis away from the search for silent beginnings and the never-ending tracing back to the original precursors towards the search for a new type of rationality and its various effects. These are the displacements and transformations of concepts. Okay, yes, th this makes sense. So, giving an example here, um, when we look at something like... Um, yeah, I'll do the example I usually do, which is the example of Newtonian mechanics uh, and the transition to something like general relativity, right? So we have been treating mass as, as essentially the same way for basically centuries and centuries, right? Um, but as we ran new experiments and began to consider um, entities that are moving at a much greater speed than what we usually observe here um, on Earth, we suddenly realize that these equations that Newton devised, his um, the laws of Newtonian mechanics, they, they fail for us. Uh, and they generate anomalies where we have these entities that just don't seem to match the equations. And this, of course, would give rise 
to an analysis and a dis so a displacement and transformation of the concepts in question, namely, for example, the analysis and trans or displacement and transformation of something like mass. Well, people try to figure out, okay, well, something's gone wrong at the base root of, the, of, of this theory. So we have to adjust the foundation. And so this means that we, there is this, this interruption um, that uh, cut it off from its empirical origin. Because there's, there's no longer what Kuhn calls the normal science, where people are using the base theory and trying to apply it to everything. Because in the process of that normal science, that's where those anomalies begin to occur where we begin to see phenomena that are not meeting, meeting our base theories. And once there's enough of these anomalies, people are like, okay, something has gone wrong here at the very base. So we have to sort of go back to the very root of our science and thoroughly analyze it and try to adjust it. So there's the displacement of something like the concept of mass and then transforming the concept of mass uh, to be something different. Um, so yeah, this makes total sense. The analyses of G. Kengelhem may serve as models. They show that the history of a concept is not wholly and entirely that of its progressive refinement, its continuously increasing rationality, its abstraction gradient, but that of its various fields of constitution and validity, that of its successful rules, successive rules of use, that of the many theoretical contexts in which it is developed, it developed and matured. There's a distinction which we also owe to Kengelhem between the microscopic and macroscopic scales of the history of the sciences, in which events and their consequences are not arranged in the same way. Thus, a discovery, the development of a method, the achievements and the failures of a particular scientist do not have the same incidents, incidents and cannot be described in the same way at both levels. On each of the two levels, a different history is being written. Okay, the microscopic and macroscopic scales of the history of the sciences. Um, I mean, I yes, I mean, the, I guess that makes sense if we're if we're writing about the history of science when we're writing about the particular development of ideas within a single individual. That history is obviously going to be very different than the macro history of the scientific community and what they are tending towards as a whole. Um, but I feel like there must be something deeper there that I'm not quite getting. I'm not. I'm not entirely sure, like why that's a profound, um, why that's something profound to say. So I'm gonna put here. Maybe it is just something that is intuitively true and isn't actually all that interesting. But for me, I want to figure out. Well, is it actually intuitively true, or is there something I'm fundamentally not understanding about what he's saying? And maybe, again, if you just keep reading, usually you can go back and you'll better understand it. Recurrent redistributions reveal several paths, several forms of connection, several hierarchies of importance, several networks of determination, several teleologies for one and the same science as the present undergoes change. Thus, historical descriptions are necessarily ordered by the present state of knowledge. They increase with every transformation and never cease and turn to break with themselves. Recurrent redistributions reveal several pasts, several forms of connection, several hierarchies of importance, several networks of... Yes, I mean, yes. So there are going to be multiple ways in which we can analyze a certain... Um, you know, we have the whole statement of the in the history of science that the victors write the scientific textbooks. Um, and that's very much true, because when we think about um, when we think about the history of science, most people don't know anything about like the caloric model or phlogiston um, or the idea of the ether. You never hear about this stuff. It's never included in any of the scientific textbooks. Instead, we see this slow. You know, we start with um, you know Aristotle's, Archimedes, you know uh, Ptolemy. Um, well, it depends on what field of science, I suppose, Lavoisier. You know, you hear about all the successful um, discoveries that led to our current state of science. But you never hear about the dominant theories that people all held that ended up just being bunk and a big flop, right? Um, how are those tacos, eh? Well, I have to buy the meat first, and then I'll let you know. Um, 
I'm guessing the general point is that the history of science is in a simple linear of one of progressive refinement. He talks about this with Chomsky, if I recall correctly. Yeah, and I mean, I totally, I totally agree with that point. Um, so lots of overlap here with what I've read, you know, in the history of science, you know, people like Thomas Kuhn, uh, Feyerabend, and Lakatos and whatnot. There are the architectonic unities of the of systems of the kind analyzed by M. Guaru, uh, which are concerned not with the description of cultural influences, traditions, and continuities, but with internal coherences, axioms, deductive connections, uh, compatibilities. Lastly, the most radical discontinuities are the breaks affected by a work of theoretical transformation, which establishes a science by detaching it from the ideology of its past and by revealing this past as ideological. To this should be added, of course, literary analysis, which now takes as its unity not the spirit or sensibility of a period, nor groups, schools, generations, or movements, nor even uh, the personality of the author and the interplay of his life and his creation, but the particular structure of a given oeuvre, book, or text. Yes, thank you very much, Snacks. I, I mentioned you at the start of this stream. I really appreciate it. Yeah, look, if you want to help uh, support me, everyone else, you can do that uh, by subbing or donating or whatever. Um, oh, yeah, wait, no, because I reset this, it does. Let me add. I need to add 25 onto here so that it's actually correct. Um, what is this? 0116. Here we go. Boom. Now it's actually correct. Um, oh, God, not structuralism. Well, I think it's deacon. He's not even referring to deacon. Oh, no. Yeah. But the particular structure of a given over book or text. Right. So. Establishes a science by detaching it from the ideology of its past and by revealing this past as ideological. That's from Althusser. Um, yeah, I suppose. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Thank you very much, Neomar. I really appreciate it. That's awesome. Foucault's nuts is right. <laughs> Uh, well, how many pages into this are we now? One, two, three. Look, we're we're making great progress here. I think I understand what he's saying. So, like the example I'm thinking of is when we started to detach, like for example, the natural sciences away from philosophy, um, or certain, um, or for example, linguistics separate from um, the philosophy of language or mathematics well mathematics was i guess very very early on um i'd like to hear if anyone else has any examples of this theoretical transformation which establishes a science by detaching it from the ideology of its past and by revealing this past as ideological i'd be very interested um in hearing some more examples of that okay and the great problem presented by such historical analyses is not how continuities are established how a single pattern is formed and preserved, how for so many different successive minds there is a single horizon, what mode of action, what substructures imply, okay, here's a weird word, substructure, okay, that's Marxian um, terminology, what mode of action, what substructures imply by the interplay of transmissions, resumptions, disappearances, and repetitions, how the origin may extend its way well beyond itself to that conclusion that is never given. The problem is no longer one of tradition, of tracing a line, but one of division, of limits. It is no longer one of lasting foundations, but one of transformations that serve as new foundations, the rebuilding of foundations. Right, I mean, that that's a, it's essentially, it's this rejection of that Enlightenment linear model, right? The idea that we start here with our, like if you imagine a graph, I guess the graph would start over here on, on your screen, you know, y x-axis this is time and this is the amount of knowledge we have you would start here and the idea of the enlightenment models it just slowly slowly increases and then this model that Foucault is suggesting and 
which I'm I'm basically reading him as essentially sort of repeating the Kunian um, the Kunian points is that instead through each successive shift we sort of have to start over because of the in- how, how incommensurable each theory is um, like the way that the discovery of the sun sector sun-centric solar system made it clear that the earth-centric model was built to bolster church ideology oh right oh i see okay or a lot of our theories about for example um uh or i imagine like law and a lot of legal theories would sort of probably be analyzed in the same way because they were so connected to um well Previously, the church, I suppose, but then later on, upholding like monarchical um, structures and then aristocratic structures and so on. Uh, I wonder if the same things, the same thing will probably happen again in another 50 years or something. I don't know. Um, what one is seeing then is the emergence of a whole field of questions, some of which are already familiar, by which this new form of history is trying to develop its own theory. How is one to specify the different concepts that enable us to conceive of discontinuity? By what criteria is one to isolate the unities with which one is dealing? What is a science? What is an oeuvre? What is a theory? What is a concept? What is a text? How is one to diversify the levels at which one may place oneself, each of which possesses its own divisions and form of analysis? What is the legitimate level of formalization? What is that of interpretation, of structural analysis, of attributions of causality? In short, the history of thought, of knowledge, of philosophy, of literature seems to be seeking and discovering more and more discontinuities, whereas history itself appears to be abandoning the eruption of events in favor of stable structures. Okay. I, I I think I think I I think I get it that in the history of thought and I suppose academics uh, or academia, if we look at the where we're analyzing history, it's gone from a more isolated model where we just look at specific uh, individuals or individualized events and try to connect it to another individualized event and then another and another. And then trying to establish, well, did this cause that and this cause that, to instead these stable models, which are these grand sort of um, overarching uh, models, whether they be economic or sociological or anthropological, um, that can be traced throughout history. Um, so we have that on the one hand, and then in respect to something like science or literary theory, um, we are now seeing sort of um, the fields almost churning in on themselves and engaging in a lot of self-analysis and looking at the history of their own thought and undermining a lot of the previously established norms about the development of ideas and thought. But that, does, that, does that sort of seem roughly correct to, to people watching? Does that, does that seem like a, at least a rough approximation of, of what he's getting at. That seems right to me. <laughs> it seems right to me, but I again, I could just be... Because I don't really... I don't have background in literary theory, so I can't really... <laughs> if I say so, yes, I do say so. Um, yeah, but I don't have the background in literary theory, so I can't really make... Um, make the same types of, of, of claims about that as I can about science, right? But we must not take it by this apparent interchange. Despite appearances, we must not imagine that certain of the historical disciplines have moved from the continuous to the discont- discontinuous, while others have moved from the tangled mass of discontinuities to the great uninterrupted unities. We must not imagine that in the analysis of politics, institutions, or economics, we have become more and more sensitive to overall determinations, while in the analysis of ideas and of knowledge, we are paying more and more attention to the play of difference. We must not imagine that these two great forms of description have crossed without recognizing one another. Okay. In fact, the same problems are being posed in either case, but they have provoked opposite effects on the surface. 
Okay. These problems may be summed up in a word, the questioning of the document. That seems very important, so I'm putting it in purple. Of course, it is obvious enough that ever since a discipline such as history has existed, documents have been used questions and have given rise to questions. Scholars have asked not only what these documents meant, but also whether they were telling the truth and by what right they could claim to be doing so, whether they were sincere or deliberately misleading, well-informed or ignorant, authentic or tampered with. But each of these questions and all this critical concern pointed to one and the same end, the reconstitution on the basis of what the documents say and sometimes merely hint at of the past from which they emanate and which has now disappeared far behind them. The document was always treated as the language of a voice since reduced to silence. It's fragile but possibly decipherable trace. So the role of document in the history of history has been essentially trying to delineate from these old documents um, what actually occurred at that given point in time. Yes, that makes sense. Now, now through a mutation that is not of very recent origin, but which has still not come to an end, history has altered its position in relation to the document. It has taken as its primary task not the interpretation of the document, nor the attempt to decide whether it is telling the truth or what is it or what is its expressive value, but to work on it from within and to develop it. History now organizes the document, divides it up, distributes it, orders it, arranges it in levels, establishes series, distinguishes between what is relevant and what is not, discovers elements, defines unities, describes relations. The fuck does that mean? <laughs> work on it from within and to develop it. History now organizes the document, divides it up, distributes it, orders it, arranges it in levels. Well, let's just keep reading and we'll see if this makes any sense, okay? The document then is no longer for history an inert material through which it tries to reconstitute what men have said or done or said. Because that when I think of history, we're realizing that history is a practice. Well, how is it not? A, how is this not a practice, though? Reconstit the reconstituting what men have done or said, the events of which only the trace remains. How is that not a practice? History is now trying to define within the documentary material itself unities, totalities, series, relations. History must be detached from the image that satisfied it for so long and through which it found its anthropological justification, that of an age-old collective consciousness that made use of material documents to refresh its memory. History is the work expended on material documentation. Books, texts, accounts, registers, acts, buildings, institutions, laws, techniques, objects, customs, etc. that exists in every time and place in every society, either in a spontaneous or in a consciously organized form. The document is not the fortunate tool of a history that is primarily and fundamentally memory. History is one way in which a society recognizes and develops a mass of documentation with which it is in, 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 inextricably linked. Okay, I think I understand now. Um, before we thought that we could get to an objective past, the text was thought to be transcendentally real. Now we understand that we create the past. Is that what he's saying? Is he saying that we create the past through the analysis of these documents? Or is it... It seems to be that when, when we find a document, it's, it's not necessarily the correct thing to go about analyzing whether it's right or not, or to view it as a representation of what actually occurred, but instead to analyze it as a document that was produced. And as it was produced, what does that say about the given society? So we're not necessarily looking solely on what it says, but instead, what does its very production say about history and society does, does that does that make any sense i feel uh kinesi have you read foucault you, you seem to kind of understand what's going on <laughs> ah that might be right too well i don't know <laughs> i don't know I, I'm just I'm just saying I haven't gotten anything about creation. I haven't gotten the idea that we are creating the past through that. Although that does sound very 
I feel like that's something that is associated with Foucault, so you might not be actually wrong in that respect, you know? Okay, he's giving us a summary here, so here we go. To be brief, then, let us say that history, in its traditional form, undertook to memorize the monuments of the past, transformed them into documents, and led speech to those traces which, in themselves, are often not verbal, or which say in silence something other than what they actually say. In our time, history is that which transforms documents into monuments. In that area where in the past history deciphered the traces left by men, it now deploys a mass of elements that have to be grouped, made relevant, placed in relation to one another to form totalities. There was a time when archaeology as a discipline devoted to silent monuments, inert traces, objects without context, and things left by the past aspired to the condition of history, and attained meaning only through the restitution of historical discourse. It might be said, to play on words a little, that in our time history aspires to the condition of archaeology, to the intrinsic description of the monument. Okay. I have no fucking idea what he just said, so let's try to break this down a little bit. Ah, <sighs> okay. To memorize the monuments of the past and transform them into documents. History is that which transforms documents into monuments. What is the difference between a monument and a and a document? I, I don't know what that means. Wait, hold on, hold on. I'm going to try to pull up a... Uh, let's see if I can find a... Uh, I bet there's a Cambridge Companion. Oh, I spelled Foucault wrong, though. Yes, there is. There's a Cambridge Companion to Foucault. <laughs> so I bet if we look at the index of this, we can find exactly what the hell that means. All right, now let me import this to Zotero. Cambridge Companion to Foucault. Okay. Open. There we go. All right. Switch him back here. Oh my god. Zoom out. Um, so let's go to the index. What was it? Monument? M. What? There's nothing. Maybe it's not. Oh, documentation. Is in one oh at one oh nine. So let's go there. We're going to one oh nine. No. Um. Monument. No, there's nothing. There's nothing here. Cambridge might be using a different translation. Hmm. Hmm. All right. And hold on again. We're going. I'm. I'm just gonna Google Foucault. Monument document. The document and monument in Michel Foucault's archaeology. Wow, it's a hundred and ten page dissertation. Holy shit. Uh well, cool. 
look, we'll read the intro to this thesis. See, this is this is what research looks like. Is you essentially just kind of bumble around and you find something that looks approximately what you're looking for. So this is literally on the archaeology. Okay, this thesis is originally from a key passage in the introduction to the archaeology of knowledge, in which Michel Foucault makes a sweeping claim about the discipline of history. He claims that history has undergone an epistemological mutation, and that this mutation has... Oh, let's, let me cite who this is. So this is from Alexander Walker at the University of Western Ontario. The dissertation is called Monuments of the Press and the Document of Monument in Michel Foucault's Archaeology. There's a TOC that has a definition of it in that thesis. What? Oh, oh yes, you're right. Wow. Fantastic. Oh, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Last chicken. All right. I want you to find monument and document according to Foucault. He claims that the document is some type of historical object or source that prior to the epistemological mutation of history, historians use... Oh, he's missing a comma. Oh, wait, no, he's not. No, yes, he is missing a comma. Uh, yeah, it should be here. Historians use as the means to construct narrative and discourse. The traditional historian assumes and therefore sees within the document some unspoken or hidden meaning or significance, which the historian is tasked with displaying. The task of the traditional historian was to find in the document and rescue from being forgotten the trace, however small, of the larger historical narrative. The document was always treated as a language of a voice since reduced to silence, its fragile, possibly decipherable trace. The traditional historian had the difficult task of assembling from the document of the past even those which seemed least likely the meta-historical narrative. The, imp sorry. the importance of the examination of the document lies in its utility as part of a historical narrative. For Foucault, this conception of the document entailed a certain neglect or of, or of or disregard for it. The historian was interested in the document only as an unproblematic indicator of historical narrative, not in itself. Any complexity that the document had, whether in connection to other documents or within itself, was ignored if it did not fit into the historian's narrative. Is that true? Is that true? That that it would, I, I feel like that's not true. That if a historian, like, from, I don't know, the 15th century came across two very conflicting reports of, like, some battle, they're not going to ignore it. Right? Wouldn't they be like, well, we don't know. But is that just not true? I don't know. I don't know about the history of history. I don't know. Are are people more far more willing now to be more um to essentially say, you know, I, I might be wrong in what I'm saying, and that previously historians would simply state, well, I'm going to find everything that supports my thesis and ignore everything that goes against it. Is that true? Maybe at a time it was true. Hmm. Well, that's a bit sad. In several works, Foucault describes the traditional approach to histor history as consistently allegorical. So contemporary criticism is abandoning the great myth of interiority. Intimior whatever it is completely detached from the old themes of nested boxes of the treasure chest that one is expected to go look for at the back of the works closet placing itself outside the text it constructs a new exteriority for it writing texts of texts traditional history reads every statement allegorically while history as archaeology reads statements as decisively not containing a concealed but accessible inner truth Contrary to documents, monuments are inert traces, objects without context, and things left by the past. The monument lacks the precise trait that is the document's greatest virtue, which is that it supports a pre-existing narrative. Foucault's characterization of the monument as inert communicates that it does not necessarily fit into a teleology as the document does. A monument is somehow simply sitting in time, isolated from any larger narrative around it. Where the document is a building block that is made to fit smoothly into a historical narrative, the monument for Foucault is somehow a cast-off, left behind by history, both as the temporal process itself and the discipline of its narration. Okay. 
Okay. Yes. This. I mean, this. This. I feel like it's kind of roughly as what I was saying in that. Um, you know, now we are looking at these documents not simply as as a bunch of words on a page that then support a greater thesis, but we look at well, why was this document created in the first place, and what does its creation mean in a larger context, whether that be historically, sociologically, anthropologically, etc. Does that make sense? I feel I I think I sort of I I feel like I understand the gist of what he's saying now. Does everyone else sort of feel on board with this now? Perhaps, maybe. <laughs> this has several consequences. First of all, there's the surface effect already mentioned, the proliferation of discontinuities in the history of ideas, and the emergence of long periods in history proper. In fact, in its traditional form, history proper was concerned to define relations of simple causality, of circular determination, of antagonism, of expression between facts or dated events. The series being known, it was simply a question of defining the position of each element in relation to the other elements in the series. The problem now is to constitute series, to define the elements proper to each series, to fix its boundaries, to reveal its own specific type of relations, to formulate its laws, and beyond this, to describe the relations between different series, thus constituting series of series or tables. Hence the ever-increasing number of strata and the need to distinguish them. This, God, I swear to God, people on the continent don't know how to use periods. They don't. How long is this sentence? It goes all the way to here. That's absurd. Use a period. Okay? Look, he uses a colon and a semicolon in the same sentence. Horrible. And I bet it's even longer in French. Seriously. What the hell's going on here? Oh, I got a message. We can't all be good British empiricists, okay? Yeah, I guess not. Um, problem now is to constitute series. Hello, Super Sam. And hello, Alley Cat. So, the problem now is to constitute series. Uh... So, I, I guess, so previously, a document was being used to, to prop up a larger narrative, right? And now, we want to look at documents, a series of documents, and see how we can fit them all together to form a new narrative? And the different ways that we can combine them to create different narratives, like a single piece, a single document can be used to construct a large variety of different narratives, depending on what strata you want to look at it from. Right. So you could look at it from like a an economical material perspective. One could look at it from like a cultural anthropological perspective. Is that sort of what he's trying to get at here? The appearance of long period the appearance of long periods in the history of today is not re a return to the philosophers of history to the great ages. Wait, no. The problem is that shit's meta now. Now we have narratives of narratives. Is that is that what he's saying? I must have missed it. Did we find what strata means? Yeah. Well, no. I we didn't get a rigorous one, but I thought it was. Well, let's let's consult the uh, let's consult. Okay, this guy doesn't even mention strata in his thesis paper, so I'm going to assume it's not a big deal. <laughs> okay, um, the appearance of long the appearance of long periods in the history of today is not a return to philosophers of history to the great ages of the world or to the periodization dictated by the rise and fall of civilizations. It is the effect of the methodologically concerted development of series, 
In the history of ideas, of thought, and of the sciences, the same mutation has brought about the opposite effect. It has broken up the long series formed by the progress of consciousness, or the teleology of reason, or the evolution of human thought. It has. I. I see. I see. I, I think. I. I think. I understand this. And I wonder if Foucault was specifically talking about like Hegelian historians, because I'm aware of like, or or Marxist analyses of histories, right? Which wants to take all of these elements, form them into a series and dictate all of these relations between them. So you get these, like, class-conscious and class-conflict narratives, right? And previously, that type of grand narrative was, of course, really present in the science, as I said, with that Enlightenment model. But then we've broken it down now, and we're less concerned about these grand sweeping narratives, but instead doing this, like, internal uh, reflection. Um, narratives of narratives are a problem of information. We can't communicate what the system is experiencing at a macro level. Can you expand on that a bit? I'm not sure I totally understand what you mean by that. It has led to the individualization of different series, which are juxtaposed to one another, follow one another, overlap and intersect without one being able to reduce them to a linear schema. Thus, in place of the continuous chronology of reason which was invariably traced back to some inaccessible origin, there appealed scales that are sometimes very brief, distinct from one another, irreducible to a single law, scales that bear a type of history peculiar to each one, and which cannot be reduced to the general model of a consciousness that acquires, progresses, and remembers. Yes. I mean, th this is essentially a rejection of this Enlightenment model. Like, the scientist working in 1850 was not placing himself solely in this grand scheme of reason where he's building on the works of everybody else. There are all these other factors which are playing a role in the laboratory as they are making these theories. And also, there's a ton of other competing theories that have been lost or ignored in scientific textbooks, right? Second consequence, the notion of discontinuity assumes a major role in the historical disciplines. For history in its classical form, the discontinuous was both the given and the unthinkable, the raw material of history, which presented itself in the form of dispersed events, decisions, accidents, initiatives, discoveries, the material which, through analysis, had to be rearranged, reduced, effaced in order to reveal the continuity of events. This continuity was the stigma of temporal dislocation that it was the historian's task to remove from history. It has now become one of the basic elements of historical analysis. Its role is threefold. First, it constitutes a deliberate operation on the part of the historian, and not a quality of the material with which he has to deal. For the must, for the must, I, th I think this is for he must, at least as a systematic hypothesis, distinguish the possible levels of analysis, the methods proper to each, and the periodization that best suits them. Okay, yes, this is all sort of falling into place here. Secondly, it is the result of his description, and not something that must be eliminated by means of his analysis, for he's trying to discover the limits of a process, the point of inflection of a curve, the inversion of a regulatory movement, the boundaries of an oscillation, the threshold of a function, the instant at which a circular causality breaks down. Yo, Rem, it's the MR Girl Army. You are a shower boy, get on. Why, thank you very much, Dorian the Cutest. I really appreciate that. <laughs> Thirdly, it is the concept that the historian's work never ceases to specify, instead of neglecting it as a uniform and different blank between two positive figures. It assumes a specific form and function according to the field and the level to which it is assigned. One does not speak of the same discontinuity when describing an epistemological threshold. Point. What? 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 It, what? Okay. So. So discontinuity. Is essentially some. Something. Some. It, I get, can it be a document or a monument? I assume it's a monument, right? The, the do, it's the monuments that are discontinuous because the documents are placeable. So the, there are these monuments which previously wanted to be transformed. 
what 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 it what was it was it Yeah, so the Right. So the monuments want to be transformed into documents. Okay. And now we want to turn the documents into monuments in new analysis of history. Um there's nothing to explain. Everything is a wave. You pick one way to see the world, and then you got to contend with all the requirements of that perspective. You're choosing to play the game when you're following a specific worldview instead of accepting what's really happening and that you don't know. You're analyzing your own thoughts, not getting more information. I, I still don't understand. <laughs> I still don't understand what you're saying, uh, infrared solution. Are you a fan of um are you a fan of the infrared show? Yeah, I wonder if it has is I wonder if do you think has knows a lot about um do you think has knows a lot of stuff about Hegel? Is he streaming? No. And he streams a lot. You should ask him. Um I could, but I also don't have to. So I think I'm going to go with that. Oh my fucking god, this is so long. Do we want to grow through this whole introduction? Um, yep, yeah. You want to, Super Sam? Okay, well, look, we're approaching an hour here. We are No, we're more than a fourth. We're almost half. I'd say we're almost half, okay? But let me say, if you're enjoying this content, this is sort of a fundraising stream uh, to pay for groceries um, because we're running low on money. Um, And if you want to support, I'm sure you all know how, but for those that maybe don't, uh, you can subscribe. You can use bits, but the best way is definitely using the donate button uh, down below, which also has a French text to speech. So if you want to help out with that and keep the content coming, there you go. Um, all right, let's dive back in here. So, yes, the notion of discontinuity. Uh, yeah, dispersed events, which through now, so it's essentially. It's some event, the object of which the historian was to place within a grander narrative. And it was the stigma of temporal dislocation because I want to be able to under... So, for example, if there's some anomaly in, like, like let's say there's some document that says that 300 troops rolled up to Marathon. I don't even remember what happened at the Battle of Marathon. But 300 troops rolled up to the Battle of Marathon, whatever. And then we find out that on that same day, like those troops were supposed to be somewhere else. There's some type of discontinuity. It's sort of an internal contradiction. Whoa. <laughs> Thank you, Facefucker69. Facefucker69 is one of my biggest supporters. And he's got one of the best names. Um are you sure you wouldn't prefer like a secondary source on Foucault instead? Well, I've got one. I've uh, well, look. Let's look up. We'll consult this. Let's consult discontinuity. Let us have a little search here. Discourse. Jeez. Okay. Well, how much is on archaeology of knowledge? There's tons on archaeology of knowledge. Okay, let's check. Discontinuity.
Ó. Oh. Yeah, I think I'm, I think I, I think that's what discontinuity is. It's basically what I said. It's something that doesn't fit into the grand narrative that someone is constructing. So that makes sense. And so, and, but now this continuity is, is it, it's no longer an obstacle to be solved through the project of history. But first, it constitutes a deliberate operation on the part of the historian. So, because there are multiple ways at which you can analyze the discontinuity, it's not it's not a it's not a matter of just taking a puzzle piece and trying to fit it into the to the larger puzzle, but actually this piece could go to a bunch of different puzzles. And so, whatever puzzle you want to choose, you have to be aware of the methods proper to each and the periodization that best suits them. Okay. Secondly, it is the result of his description. And not something that must be eliminated by means of his analysis. So it's only discontinuity in virtue of the way that the historian is describing it. Is that is that what he is saying? Because I don't really understand these examples. Like the limits of a pro I assume that these are different... The inversion of a regulatory movement, the boundaries of an oscillation, the threshold of a function, the instant at which a circular... Like, these are different ways that, that a historian could utilize a discontinuity, such as a certain event that has yet to be placed within a narrative. Um, okay. It is the concept that the historian's work never ceases to specify. Instead of neglecting it as a uniform, indifferent blank between two positive figures... It assumes a specific form and function according to the field and the level to which it is assigned. One does not speak of the same discontinuity when describing an epistemological threshold, the point of reflection in a population curve, or the replacement of one technique by another. That makes sense, because there are very many different ways to describe a given discontinuity, whatever form that discontinuity takes. So the thesis describe that discontinuity individual people politics wars it's it's essentially just a slice of history that has yet to been placed within a grander narrative i assume that that seems to be what i'm getting out of this and because it has yet to be placed it obviously you know placing it within something is going to you know essentially change what the discontinuity is whether it's an epistemological threshold, the point of reflection in a population curve, or the replacement of one technique by another. Okay. The notion of discontinuity is a paradoxical one, because it is both an instrument and an object of research, because it divides up the field of which it is the effect, because it enables the historian to individualize different domains, but can be established only by comparing those domains, and because in the final analysis, perhaps, it is not simply a concept present in the discourse of the historian, but something that the historian secretly supposes to be present. On what basis, in fact, could he speak without this discontinuity that offers him history, and his own history, as an object? One of the most essential features of the new history is probably this displacement of the discontinuity, discontinuous, its transference from the obstacle to the work itself, its integration into the discourse of the historian where it no longer plays the role of an external condition that must be reduced, but that of a working concept, and therefore the inversion of signs by which it is no longer the negative of the historical reading, its underside, its failure, the limit of its power, but the positive element that determines its object and validates its analysis. I mean, yes, that makes sense. So previously in the old historical method, it is simply, um, where was it? Reduced. Yeah, it's not an external condition that must be reduced, but instead, the very object, yeah, so the very object that is to be studied by the historian, in a sense, is what gives birth to talking about that object in the first place, right? Because it's, because it's presumably the methods of history. And the analysis we want to develop is going to be, in turn, determined by 
a series of these discontinuities, right? Is what I'm saying making sense? Like I have 10 discontinuities and the analysis that I want to arrive at is going to be determined by these discontinuities, but the analysis is itself applied to those discontinuities in a way that it is paradoxical. So it is both an instrument and an object of research because it divides up the field of which it is the effect because it enables the historian to individualize different domains but can be established only by comparing those domains. That that makes a lot of sense to me, but maybe maybe I'm misunderstanding it, I don't know. Third consequence, the theme and the possibility of a total history begin to disappear and we see the emergence of something very different that might be called a general history. The project of a total history is one that seeks to reconstitute the overall form of a civilization, the principal, material or spiritual, of a society, the significance common to all the phenomena of a period, the law that accounts for their cohesion, what is called metaphorically the face of a period. Very Hegelian. Such a project is linked to two or three hypotheses. It is supposed that between all the events of a well-defined spatiotemporal area, between all the phenomena of which traces have been found, it must be possible to establish a system of homogeneous relations, a network of causality that makes it possible to derive each of them relations of analogy, um, relations of analogy that show how they symbolize one another or how they all express one and the same central core. It is also supposed that one and the same form of historicity operates upon economic structures, social institutions and customs, the inertia of mental attitudes, technological practice, political behavior, and subjects them all to the same type of transformation. Lastly, it is supposed that history itself may be articulated into great units, stages or phases, which contain within themselves their own principle of cohesion. Again, Foucault, really long sentence that could be very easily broken up. Thank you so much, Questionable Wombat. Uh, for the for the sub, so this also makes sense to me that in the previous this previous um idea of history, all of these changes were in a sense governed by this by the same object or the same cause. So cultural transformation, economic transformation, population, demographic uh, uh, transformation, epistemological transformations. These were all part of a, a grand like what he's calling this grand face or total history. Uh, that I mean, this seems to be, the, this is the Hegelian history, right? This idea of these grand sweeping churns um, that completely transforms over and over um, um, different geographical regions. What do you make of this total general history distinction? Well, I don't know exactly what he means by general history yet. Um, I'm understanding what he means by total history. So let's see here. Um, these are the postulates that are challenged by the new history when it speaks of series, divisions, limits, differences of levels, shifts, chronological specificities, particular forms of rehandling, possible types of relation. This is not because it is trying to obtain a plurality of histories juxtaposed and independent of one another, that of the economy beside that of institutions, and beside these two, those of science, religion, or literature, nor is it because it is merely trying to discover between these different histories coincidences of dates or analogies of form and meaning. The problem that now presents itself, and which defines the task of a general history, is to determine what form of relation may be legitimately described between these differing, different series, what vertical system they are capable of forming, what interplay of correlation and dominance exists between them, what may be the effect of shifts, different temporalities, and various rehandlings, in what distinct totalities certain elements may figure simultaneously. In short, not only what series, but also what series of series, or in other words, what tables it is possible to draw up. A total description draws all phenomena around a single center, a principle, a meaning, a spirit, a worldview, an overall shape. A general history, on the contrary, would deploy the space of a dispersion. Okay, I totally agree. I totally agree with Foucault here. So I get it that this that the traditional historical approach was again one of this total history, where you sort of have this this analysis from the get go, like this Hegelian idea of 
of class conflict, for example, and everything just gets completely subsumed under that. So um, liter literary changes, scientific changes, religious changes, these are all to be explained by reference to this grand scale. The cause is fundamentally the same. But this new approach sort of starts from the bottom up because there are a bunch of different histories that can be constructed, right? So there are a bunch of these monuments that we've talked about, these discontinuities that can be arranged into a series. And this series might be an economic analysis. It might be an institutional analysis. It might be a scientific analysis or history analysis, history. I'm, I'm, I mean those interchangeably. Um, and the general history is then taking these series, which have been formed up by these base uh, discontinuities, and seeing how can they, what, what relations can we form between these series, which series can form together to form a, a coherent whole, which are these tables. And that seems to me the right way to go about it. It seems to me that the idea of the total history, that seems to presuppose too much. And I wonder if the reason why we've shifted now to this different, differing approach to history is in a sense because we're more empirically minded and we're more aware of our fallibility. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, what's Hegelian and what's Foucault? I've never touched a single sociology course. Yes, I recommend the very short introduction series, which is actually really, really, really good. Um, I can't really explain Hegel in... <laughs> I, but I, I hope that explanation, again, if anyone in chat disagrees with my interpretation when I'm reading, please feel free to tell me, you know, but this, this really makes sense to me. And I am more um, inclined to agree that a general history is the way to go about doing history rather than a, than a total history, you know, um, but, oh, what's this? Um, hmm. save up to 50% on AB books yeah they're all going to be garbage books let's be real all right fourth and last consequence the new history is confronted by a number of methodological problems several of which no doubt existed long before the emergence of the new history but which taken together characterize it these include the building up of coherent and homogeneous corpora of documents, open or closed, exhaust or, in, or inexhaustible inexhaust, corpora, the establishment of a principle of choice according to whether one wishes to treat the documentation exhaustively or adopt a sampling method as in statistics or try to determine in advance which are the most representative elements, the definition of the level of analysis and of the relevant elements. Yep. Yep, the specification of a method of analysis, the delimitation of groups and subgroups that articulate the material, the determination of relations that make it possible to characterize a group. Yeah, I mean, th this, this all makes sense, that if you're going to be doing a, a history essentially from the bottom up, uh, and there's going to be many different series that you can arrange of historical discontinuities, these are going to be governed by different levels of analyses. And so the analysis, the method of analysis and what is relevant to an economic history is going to be very different than the type of discontinuities or monuments that are relevant to a, to a scientific history, right? You're going to leave out, like, for example, when we're doing a history of science, do we confine ourselves to the lab notes of the historians? Do we, or actually, no, even for that, do we confine ourselves to the published papers of the scientists? Or do we include as well their own lab notes? Do we include their biographical history? Do we include their religious affiliations? Do we include the relationships they formed with other scientists, perhaps with cultural figures? Do we take into account the cultural um, norms at the time? Do we take into account the literature that they might have been reading at the time? Right? That all makes a lot of sense to me. Um, all these problems are now part of the methodological field of history. This field deserves attention and for two reasons. First, because one can see to what extent it has freed itself from what constituted, not so long ago, the philosophy of history and from the question that it, uh, that it posed on the rationality or teleology of historical development, 
on the relativity of historical knowledge and on the possibility of discovering or constituting a meaning in the inertia of the past and in the infinished totality of the present. Yeah, yeah, no. Secondly, because it intersects at certain points problems that are met within other fields in linguistics, eth ethnology, economics, literary analysis, and mythology, for example. These problems may, if one so wishes, be labeled structuralism, but only under certain conditions. They do not, of themselves, cover the entire methodological field of history. They occupy only one part of that field, a part that varies in importance with the area and level of analysis. Apart from a number of relatively limited cases, they have not been imported from linguistics or ethnology, as is often the case today, but they originated in the field of history itself, more particularly in that of economic history and as a result of the questions posed by that discipline. Lastly, in no way do they authorize us to speak of a structuralism of history, or at least of an attempt to overcome a conflict or opposition between structure and historical development. It's a long time now since historians uncovered, described, and analyzed structures, without ever having occasion to wonder whether they were not allowing the living, fragile, pulsating history to slip through their fingers. The structure development opposition is relevant neither to the definition of the historical field nor, in all probability, to the definition of a structural method. Okay, that is a lot to unpack. So, the methodological field of history, yes, when we know what that is. First, right, okay, so what is now being done in history at this time used to be done in the philosophy of history, where history itself, it, it's, a, it's sort of the same thing, well, no, it's different now in science. I'd say in science, I wonder how long it will take for science to undergo the same transformation that history presumably saw. Because science itself is not undergoing that same type of internal analysis. Well, it, it, sorry, it did, but it, I don't think it's had the same type of pronounced effects that it definitely had on the field of history, you know? So, yeah, they, it should be, you should be able to get them through most um, academic institutions. And if not, there's always LibGen, but you didn't hear that from me. Um so that, that makes sense. Um, secondly, because it intersects at certain points, problems that are met in with other fields. Um, I don't, I don't really understand. I don't understand. Let us speak of a structuralism of history. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what this means. Lastly, in no way do they authorize us to speak of a structuralism of history, or at least of an attempt to overcome a conflict or opposition between structure and historical development. Yeah, so I'm not sure what this entire section actually means. So, if anyone has any ideas, let me know in the chat. But that's just one tiny point. Hopefully, the entire... Uh, the entire rest of the introduction doesn't hinge on it. Okay, so we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven pages left. We're making good progress here. And then I'm going to bed. <laughs> okay. The epistemological mutation of history is not yet complete, but it is not of recent origin either, since its first phase can no doubt be traced back to Marx, but it took a long time to have much effect. Even now, and this is especially true in the case of the history of thought, it has been neither registered nor reflected upon, while other more recent transformations, those of linguistics for example, have been. It is as if it was particularly different, or ugh, it is as if it was particularly difficult in the history in which men retrace their own ideas and their own knowledge to formulate a general theory of discontinuity of series of limits, unity, specific orders, and differentiated autonomies and dependency. As if, in that field where we had become used to seeking origins, to pushing back further and further the line of antecedents, to reconstituting traditions, to following ev uh, evolutive curves, projecting teleologies, and to having constant recourse to metaphors of life, we felt a particular repugnance to conceiving of difference, to describing separations and dispersions, to dissociating the reassuring form of the identical. 
or to be more precise, as if we found it difficult to construct a theory, to draw general conclusions, and even to derive all the possible implications of these concepts, thresholds, mutations, independent systems, and limited series, in the way in which they have been used in fact by historians, as if we were afraid to conceive of the other in the time of our own thought. Well, that's a very vague claim that I don't quite understand, but I think the main point is essentially that we can... I mean, this is essentially how history is now being uh, understood. It's moved away from the traditional uh, form of history. Um, but there hasn't been any more general attempt to have a meta-conversation about the current state of history. I assume that's essentially what he's saying, and that actually it's a little bit scary to have a conversation about what kind of analyses are legitimate how should we relate these uh like there's no abstract discussion of that type of sort which is done in linguistics of course all the time um oh there's a reason for this if the history of thought could remain the locus of uninterrupted continuities if it could endlessly forge connections that no analysis could undo without abstraction if it could weave around everything that men say and do obscure synthesis that anticipate for him prepare him and lead him endlessly towards his future it would provide a privileged shelter for the sovereignty of consciousness continuous history is the indispensable correlative of the founding function of the subject the guarantee that everything that has eluded him may be restored to him. The certainty that time will disperse nothing without restoring it in a reconstituted unity. The promise that one day the subject, in the form of historical consciousness, will once again be able to appropriate, to bring back under his sway, all those things that are kept at a distance by difference, and find in them what might be called his abode. That's, this to me, is very true. Uh, and I wonder if it is to you guys, but I mean, honestly, I've, I haven't thought that much about it, but, you know, I have a very keen interest in history and my interest in history is just finding out what has happened. But if there is this, if this traditional image of history as going back through the documents and just establishing what has happened is actually essentially a false flag. And in reality, all these documents and these monuments that historians use to construct narratives can give rise to a variety of different analyses, which at times might be conflicting with each other and might be able to form different series of themselves in different ways, then, you know, then we no longer have this privileged shelter. We don't have continuous history. We have competing narratives of history none of which are, in a sense, any more correct than the others. Oh my god, I'm becoming a relativist. I'm becoming a post-structuralist. What's going on here? I mean, this is very... This all seems very correct to me. It's kind of scary, isn't it? But it's, it's true. It is scary and true. I guess most scary things are true, aren't they? That's actually probably not true. It's not true that most spiders will kill me, but I still find them scary. Wow. Yeah, he is roping me in. That's exactly right. Foucault is completely roping me in. 100%. All right. Making historical analysis the discourse of the continuous and making human consciousness the original subject of all historical development and action are the two sides of the same system of thought. Okay, hold on. Making historical analysis the discourse of the continuous and making human consciousness the original subject of all historical development and all action are the two sides of the same system of thought. Okay. Yes. In this system, time is conceived in terms of totalization and revolutions are never more than moments of consciousness. Ooh. Okay. Um... Okay, wait. Making historical analysis the discourse of the continuous and making human consciousness the original subject of all historical development and all action are the two sides of the same system of thought. 
In this system, time is conceived in terms of totalization, and revolutions are never more than moments of consciousness. I understand the first part. I don't understand revolutions are never more than moments of consciousness. You have no idea what that means. Yeah. Um, I mean, human consciousness being the original subject of all historical development and all action. I mean, that that's right. That, I mean, I, I think he's referencing Hegel. I'm almost certain this, this seems like a reference to Hegel to me. Um, like the idea that like certain revolutions are the idea of the world spirit like articulating itself as grand as human consciousness sort of collectivizes into one being and undergoes this great struggle um that that's we're gonna we'll come back to this okay in various forms this theme has played a constant role since the 19th century to preserve against all the centerings the sovereignty of the subject and the twin figures of anthropology and humanism. Against the decentering operated by Marx, by the historical analysis of the relation of production, economic determinations, and the class struggle, it gave place, towards the end of the 19th century, to the search for total history, in which all the differences of a society might be reduced to a single form, to the organization of a world view, to the establishment of a system of values, to a coherent type of civilization. To the decentering operated by the Nietzschean genealogy, it opposed the search for original foundation that would make rationality the telos of mankind, and link the whole history of thought to the preservation of this rationality, to the maintenance of this teleology, and to the ever necessary return to this foundation. Preparing for your Mr. Girl debate. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what I'm doing, Felix. Me and Mr. Girl are gonna just gonna chat for hours about uh about Foucault. That that's how did you know? Couldn't he have said this in a way where anyone could understand what he's trying to say? Well then he wouldn't be Foucault. <laughs> then he'd be a good writer. <laughs> Gotta un oh the age of consent, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well oh. um Right. Well, this this is sort of making sense to me. It's an it's an op it's an opposition to this idea that humankind is slowly approaching its full the full realization of its rationality and consciousness. Again, speaks like that's very Hegelian, right? I'm pretty sure that's super super Hegelian, uh, and it's the rejection of that idea that there is no fundamental end of rationality that humankind is ever approaching that all of the revolutions in history are not just slow recognitions of errors and you know in the history of science you know all of these revolutions that we undergo they are not simply just a re-examination and return to the foundation of what is rational it's not it's not a built a continual building upon it's a complete destruction over and over again and a starting anew you know so it's not a return to the foundation it's a return to the beginning and the beginning is what is overturned each time you know lastly more recently when the researches of psychoanalysis linguistics and ethnology have decentered the subject in relation to the laws of his desire the forms of his language the rules of his action or the games of oh of course well, this is th this this makes sense. Why fucking <laughs> Noam Chomsky is not a big fan of Foucault, because Noam Chomsky is a nativist. He believes in a universal grammar, a universal human rationality. So of course that's going to absolutely. Oh, now I kind of want to watch the Foucault Chomsky debate now that I sort of kind of have a gist of what's going on. What do we think? Does anyone want to watch the Foucault? Um, should we watch the Foucault um, Chomsky debate? Or maybe we'll leave that to tomorrow. Maybe we'll watch that tomorrow, huh? No, no, no. Let's, okay, no, no, no. I'm not going to let myself do that. We'll finish this. Look, there's only like one, two, three, four, five, six pages left. And then tomorrow, 
we will watch the Foucault Chomsky debate. Okay. All right. Okay. Cool. 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 Where were we? Uh, lastly, more recently, yada yada, rules of his action are the gains of his mythical or fabulous discourse when it became clear that man himself, questioned as to what he was, could not account for his sexuality and his unconscious, the systematic forms of his language, or the regularities of his fictions. The theme of a continuity of history has been reactivated once again, a history that would be not division, but development, not an interplay of relations, but an internal dynamic. Not a system, but the hard work of freedom. Not form, but the unceasing effort of a consciousness turned upon itself, trying to grasp itself in its deepest conditions. A history that would be both an act of long, uninterrupted patience and the vivacity of a movement which, in the end, breaks all bounds. If one is to assert this theme, which, to the Im immobility of structures, to their closed system, to their necessary synchrony, opposes the living openness of history, one must obviously deny in the historical analyses themselves the use of discontinuity, the definition of levels and limits, the description of specific series, the uncovering of the whole interplay of differences. Hmm. Right. So if one wants to return to this idea of total history that Foucault was talking about, you have to deny in the historical analyses themselves the use of discontinuity, the definition of love. Like, the idea of discontinuity no longer really makes any sense when we're talking about a total history, where human history is just this slow march towards progress and towards rationality. Uh, because it isn't, dis it's not a discont. it's only a discontinuity at first, and the role of the historian, of the scientist, of the linguist, of whatever, is to put it in its rational place where it becomes a continuity again. So, one is led, therefore, to anthropo anthropo anthropologize, oh, fuck me, anthropologize, anthropologize, anthropologize Marx, to make of him a historian of totalities, and to rediscover in him the message of humanism. One is led, therefore, to interpret Nietzsche in the term of transcendental philosophy, and to reduce his genealogy to the level of a search for origins. Lastly, one is led to leave to one side as if it had never arisen that whole field of methodological problems that the new history is now presenting. For, if it is asserted that the question of discontinuities, systems and transformations, series and thresholds, arises in all the historical disciplines, and in those concerned with ideas with the sciences no less than those concerned with economics and society, how could one oppose with any semblance of legitimacy development and system, movement and circular regulations, or, as it is sometimes put crudely and unthinkingly, history and structure? Right. Okay. Yeah. So, essentially, these historians that want, or not just historians, but academics who want to retain their grip on this what I call the Enlightenment model, have to anthropologize, anthropologize Marx. And this is true. This is how I have come to understand Marx. But it seems like Foucault interprets Marx in a different way, in a way that doesn't emphasize the continuity. Because I've always understood Marx as the gradual approach, the necessary approach towards complete and utter rationality, which would arise in a communist state. Um, but it's... Which which would make him a historian of totalities, and to rediscover him the but so does this mean that Foucault reads Marx very differently, um, and then to interpret Nietzsche in terms of the transcendental philosophy, which I've which was an old tendency for people to do, which people no longer do. People really recognize Nietzsche as the relativist and nihilist. Well, he's not a nihilist, but he's certainly a relativist that he is. Lastly, one is led to leave to one side as if it had never... And, of course, we've gone through that. Um, okay. The same conservative function is at work in the theme of cultural totalities, for which Marx has been criticized, then travestied, in the theme of a search for origins, which was opposed to Nietzsche before an attempt was made to transpose him into it, and in the theme of a living, continuous, open history. 
The cry goes up that one is murdering history whenever, in a historical analysis, and especially if it is concerned with thought, ideas, or knowledge, one is seen to be using in too obvious a way the categories of discontinuity and difference, the notions of threshold, rupture, and transformation, the description of series and limits. I mean, I, I'd love to, I wish he would give an example of this. I'd like to see an example of this, you know, a good writer would provide us examples of this uh, to better illustrate what the fuck you mean. But I get the impression Foucault is not a very good writer. Uh, one, one will be denounced for attacking the inalienable rights of history and the very foundations of any possible historicity. But one must not be deceived. What is being bewailed with such vehemence is not the disappearance of history, but the eclipse of that form of history that was secretly, but entirely related to the synthetic activity of the subject. What is being bewailed is the development of that was to provide the sovereignty of the consciousness with a safer, less exposed shelter than myths, kinship systems, languages, sexuality, or desire. What is being bewailed is the possibility of reanimating through the project the work of meaning or the movement of totalization, the interplay of material determinations, rules of practice, unconscious systems, rigorous but unreflected relations, correlations that elude all lived experience. What is being bewailed is that ideological use of history by which one tries to restore to man everything that has unceasingly eluded him for over a hundred years. All the treasure of bygone days was crammed into the old citadel of this history. It was thought to be secure, it was sacri sacralized, it was made the last resting place of anthropological thought. It was even thought that its most inf inf inveterate enemies could be captured and turned into vigilant guardians. But the historians had long ago deserted the old fortress and gone to work elsewhere. It was realized that neither Marx nor Nietzsche were carrying out the guard duties that had been entrusted to them. They could not be depended on to preserve privilege, nor to affirm once and for all. And God knows it is needed in the distress of today that history, at least, is living and continuous, that it is, for the subject in question, a place of rest, certainty, reconciliation, a place of tranquilized sleep. Okay, well, we know that. He's just sort of restating his entire thesis of the introduction. All right. Okay, and this is just a summary of a book. So what do we think? What do we think about this idea of, I mean, I understand now, like, why everyone talks about narratives and stuff and why people view him as a relativist. Because essentially he is decrying and criticizing this idea of the totality of nature as though all of history, whatever form it takes, can be crammed into a single model. Because it fails to reflect the actual methodology by which scientists do that. Or, and historians do that. Because the very analysis of history itself is given rise to through the investigation of history, which is that sort of paradox that he was talking about earlier. And history, in a sense, is undetermined, under underdetermined, isn't it? Does rejecting a total history make him a relativist? Well, it seems to, does it not? Because, in a sense, he's admitting that. Well, I don't know. He's rejecting a, to a, a, a teleology, but he, you know, you notice that he's not saying. Yes, yes, that's right. He, that's right. He is not saying that every interpretation is fine, but I think he's saying that there are multiple interpretations that can be fine. Right. Except, okay, cool. Last chicken. You make me feel better because it's good that we're getting sort of the same thing out of this. That makes me feel more <laughs> confident in my interpretation. Um, but yeah, that was actually good. That was um a lot better than I thought it would be, and I'm excited to keep reading. And tomorrow, we will read um, we'll read or we'll watch the Foucault um, the Foucault Chomsky debate. I think that will be a lot of fun. And look, seventy bucks halfway. So I'll, I'll this will be continuing into tomorrow, um, and hopefully we can reach one fifty by then. That'd be really great. Um, obviously this is a kind of a one off stream. I just thought I'd give it a shot and see what people uh, people like about it. I'm thinking maybe what I could do is instead of streaming this, 
Or I don't know. Maybe I could do like private streams on a separate because I'm just honestly, I'm aware of viewer count, right? And because I want to reach partner. So I have to be strategic. But what if for people who really like this content, I did like a separate Discord stream, like I could set up like a patron or for people who are subscribed, I can do subs like a su subscriber only like once a week kind of book club sort of thing. We could keep reading this, for example. Is that something that would interest the people who are here right now? Well, let, let me just switch back to this here. Is that, is that anything that be uh, something people want to see? Because I'm definitely open to doing that. Oh, it's Hey, Entropy. You're just catching the tail end of the stream here. Yeah, that'd be pretty cool. I don't know uh, how badly these kinds of stream affect your partnership application. I mean, like, today's stream is probably going to average out at, like, 25 viewers, right? Uh, I started streaming at the exact same time Destiny was, which is immediately almost kind of a death blow um, to my stream because there's so much overlap between our communities. Um, and, you know... Like, let's be real, like Destiny's, uh, you know, DGG likes likes the drama and stuff. So I think maybe on this stream, I focus more on sort of brief pre-planned lectures and also just debates with people and maybe reacting to whatever videos there are. And then for those subscribers who want to help support to the other side, I can do those more private streams where we work through different texts and whatnot. So... I'll I'll tweet something out on Twitter, and if you're interested in uh, contributing to that, uh, just yeah, re reply to it. But um, I've got to go because Warren is in the other room, and um, he's basically locked himself in there, and I have to make food. Um, but thank you, everyone uh, who contributed, who participated, who watched. I uh, hope you guys have a good uh, rest of your night, and I'll be back tomorrow. I'm Tomorrow I'm going to start streaming, I think, at 9 p.m. Eastern, which is 12, no, no, which is 3 a.m. in most of Europe, <laughs> uh, so for Europe people, uh, and I think 6 p.m. Uh, Pacific. So I feel bad for those poor Europeans. So. Anyways, um, thanks, everyone, for turning out. Um, you know how to support me i've already said that um follow me on twitter it's bath underscore boy with an eye and i'm right away i'm going to upload this vod to youtube so if you catch the tail end of this check out the youtube or you can just watch the vod on the twitch channel i suppose but i'm uploading this right to youtube so all right uh i love you all and i will see you guys tomorrow goodbye